Hi, my name is Brooks Gibbs. I'm a youth crisis counselor. I'm an author, a speaker, and a bullying expert. I've been passionate about this topic for over 15 years. I got started because the Columbine shooting happened in a town that I lived in called Littleton, Colorado. In 1999, which was known as the birthplace of the anti-bullying movement, the Columbine shooting happened. Two shooters killed 15 people and ultimately turned guns on themselves. And uh, this homicide, suicide, was the birthplace of uh, what we now call the anti-bullying movement. It was that tragedy that really united all kinds of parents, uh, educators, and mental health professionals. We, uh, we all band together to say, how can we stop this violence? Because we know kids kill themselves if they're bullied and none of us want to see that happen. And we know kids have the capacity to kill others in retaliation. So homicide and suicide are always committed by people who feel like victims. And because of that very fact, the anti-bullying movement has uh, been on a crusade to stop uh, mean behavior and ultimately help victims. Now, uh, unfortunately, a lot of bullying experts try to uh, help victims indirectly, meaning they change the world around the victim because they believe the victim is powerless to do anything about their social problem. And if you believe that a victim of bullying is powerless to solve their own social problem, then of course you're going to try to change the world around the victim um, because he's powerless. Uh, you're probably thinking like an attorney, and so you're going to pass laws, you're going to empower bystanders, you're going to punish bullies, police hallways, uh, you're going to try to, you know, reform a bully or discipline a bully or kick a bully out of school. And that's how most of, most of the people in the anti-bully movement, they kind of head in the legal, uh, the legal way. And unfortunately, it has not helped us that much, uh, despite all of our efforts to really try to police niceness and legislate a mean behavior and punish bullies. Uh, it's kind of backfired. There was a recent study in 2013 that was done by the University of Texas in Arlington that said uh, students with uh, anti-bullying policies and procedures um, were more likely to be bullied or experience bullying than those students that had no policies at their school. And that was a really interesting study. Over 50,000 kids uh, participated in the research in all 50 states in the United States. And uh, the conclusion of the study was mind-boggling. Is what we're doing hurting our efforts? Is a legal approach to crack down on mean behavior actually backfiring? Uh, my friends, the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, we should rethink the way we do things and we should take a psychological approach. A psychological approach. Now, an, an attorney can't think like a psychologist. An attorney thinks like an attorney. And here's how an attorney thinks. If a victim comes to an attorney, then uh, the attorney will look at that victim and say, what's the problem? The victim will say, I feel like a victim. Then the attorney will say, well, don't worry about a thing. I will take care of the problem for you. It is my job to protect you and to punish the perpetrator to the full extent of the law. I will paint a picture that will make you look like an innocent angel, and I will make the perpetrator look like a guilty villain. And uh, I will demonize him, dehumanize him. I will make sure that he pays. And I will make sure that everybody, the world around you, accommodates your weakness or your sensitivity. That's how an attorney thinks. So when the anti-bully movement went law, they thought we need to protect victims because victims can do nothing about their social problems and we should change the world around them. But a psychologist thinks completely different. A psychologist is trained not to change the world around the victim, but to change the victim, to show the victim um, how he or she might be contributing to the problem, to give the victim some ideas or techniques or thoughts of how they might uh, you know, become resilient, meaning that the words or actions of others is impenetrable to their feelings. Um, they can protect their feelings. The counselor psychologist will help the victim realize that they need to take personal responsibility for their own feelings and their own actions, um, and that they can maybe respond to their enemy with a couple little tweaks or techniques that will change the behavior of their enemy. In other words, 
the psychologist or the counselor helps the victim directly by changing the victim. Whereas the attorney tries to help the victim indirectly by changing the world around the victim. Well, my approach, just so I'm clear right off the bat, is I take a psychological approach to empower victims of bullying to solve their own social problems. Because when they discover the skill of resilience and the golden rule, the two things all my teachings are built on, then they will develop social skills that will serve them well their whole life. Because we all know bullying is not just a school problem, but it's a human nature problem that follows every kid around his whole life. There's bullying in every college. There's bullying in every workplace. There's bullying in every neighborhood. In every marriage, half of all marriages break up in divorce because couples bully each other. There's even bullying in churches and synagogues. People are trying to dominate each other and humiliate each other and gossip about each other and backbite and wound each other with words. Man, you know where the most bullying happens? Right in the home. Siblings rival like master bullies. They know exactly how to drive their sibling crazy and they love doing it. You see, bullying, as I'm about to explain, is a human nature, like instinctive trait that we cannot rid the world of. Um, it's not necessarily criminal behavior like many people think, but rather it's natural impulsive behavior that comes from a desire to dominate and survive in the midst of a social conflict. So you kind of have an idea where I'm headed. If you enjoy psychologically sound solutions, you're going to love this teaching series. If you love common sense, ancient wisdom, moral teachers, you're going to love this teaching series. Um, and frankly, uh, if you do what I teach, if you really listen carefully and you use the techniques on the kids in your life, you're going to see a dramatic transformation. I have developed these over the last 15 years. I've uh, spoken over a thousand times, over a thousand school assemblies. I've spoken to over three million students around the world. I've toured extensively in seven countries uh, since I was, you know, graduated high school and um, really uh, dove into this whole world of social aggression. Um, I'm an author of a best-selling book that Amazon.com said was one of the top 10 books to help teens. Uh, man, I just love what I do. I've been mentored by the greatest thinkers alive, I think. If you're a fan of Love and Logic with, with uh, Dr. Charles Fay, you're going to love my teachings because it's in harmony with him. He's been a huge mentor in my life. His, his teachings have helped thousands, including me. If you're a fan of Why Try with the great social worker Christian Moore, you're going to love my teachings. Uh, Christian Moore actually said that, that uh, my teachings on resilience are the best he's ever heard. Uh, if you're a fan of one of the greatest school psychologists on the planet who's taught over 40,000 mental health professionals, his name's a school psychologist Izzy Kalman, um, you're going to love my teaching. He's a master teacher on the golden rule and how the golden rule relates to bullying. And uh, many of my thoughts have been tremendously influenced by him. So, man, i just so excited. And before I give you the techniques, I want to first make sure that you and I are on the same page. That we, when we talk about the word bully or the behavior of bullying, that we're thinking in the same, you know, in, in the same terms. So I want to do a really rapid, quick history lesson on the word bully and uh, how the word bully has evolved over time. So get your pen and paper, get ready to take notes, because you're about to learn something I bet you never even knew. The word bully is a word that came uh, from a word, uh, it's, a, it's a Middle Dutch word is what I'm trying to say. Um, bully uh, in the 16th century was used to describe a friend. Did you know that? The word bully originally 
was a term to describe a loved one, a friend. So if you want to introduce people to your best friends, you would say, hey, I want to introduce you to my bullies. Isn't that incredible? Bully meant sweetheart or lover or best friend. And that happened all the way up to the 18th century, I believe. Yeah, 16th to 18th century. It meant friend. And then it changed a little bit. When this country started, we took the European influence of, of the word uh, bully and we brought it over and we used it as a term to uh, really refer to anything good. All right? So, in the 19th to the 20th century, it was a term to use uh, to describe something good. So if I said good for you, I would use the word bully for you. Bully for you. Uh, it's so foreign to our mindset now because we've been so culturally influenced uh, uh, the, where the word means something totally different today. But uh, let's say in 1903, you would use the word bully uh, if you were cool. In fact, uh, did you know that the word bully was a term used uh, and, and, and thrown around uh, in 1903, 1904? Uh, who made it really in vogue was uh, President Teddy Roosevelt. He would use the, the word bully in almost every speech. There's one famous speech that he gave. He had just gotten shot. A bullet went through his lung. Shortly thereafter, he stood up and gave a three-hour oration, a three-hour speech that he ended with the climactic term, bully! And everybody in the crowd yelled back, bully! And it basically, basically meant good or victory. The victory is ours. We can overcome. Man, um, what a difference. In fact, Teddy Roosevelt called the White House the bully pulpit. The bully pulpit. And it simply, to him, meant the greatest platform in the world to do the most good. The greatest platform in the world to do the most good. Bully was a term to describe anything good, and it was hyper in vogue. In fact, in the early 1900s, Congress passed a law that that uh, schools should consolidate and uh, teenagers like 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old had to leave the workplace or the factory jobs and go to the consolidated schoolhouses with elementary, middle, and high school. And uh, the word bully was used a lot in school, but again, never as a term for like the intimidator that we use it in, you know, like a mean person, always for something good. These are my friends. Bully for you. So uh, what happened? What in the world happened? I'll tell you what happened. It was a guy by the name of Dan Oveas, a Norwegian researcher who was commissioned by his government to study a spat of violence uh, throughout a school district in his area. They said, please basically research why these kids are fighting all the time, bickering all the time, busting out into fights and even taking weapons on campus. So he studied and he came up uh, with a lot of information. He realized that there was direct ways to assault each other, like calling each other names or pushing and shoving. There was indirect ways or more subtle ways, like spreading rumors or gossip or excluding people from their cool group. And he wanted one word to describe the multitude of negative, hateful behaviors. And he chose the word bully. That's when everything changed. Dan Oveis, Dr. Dan Oveis, chose the word bully. Uh, and in the mid 20th century, uh, that word and his research influenced uh, many parts of the world. Uh, bully was now a term that was used as an assault, or uh, the best word is intimidation. He gave three distinct ingredients of what makes a bully. In fact, many state laws about bullying says that these three things have to be in order to effectively call it bullying. And if you have those laws in your state, it's because Dan Oveas defined these three things. The first thing the first thing is that there must be an imbalance of power for it to be called bully. 
Um, bullying means that someone is dominating another person. There is a power imbalance. Now, this does not necessarily mean that, uh, you know, like it, a physical dominance, because we all know that a little three-year-old can bully his parents. A little three-year-old can scream his head off or, or keep throwing the food on the floor and, and, and driving his parents crazy. He's having power over his parents. How? Because he's driving them crazy. He has the ability to get their goat. He has the ability to drive them mad. A petite little cheerleader can drive a big, strong quarterback football player mad crazy by spreading rumors about him or by just calling him names or taunting him. It's not because of a physical imbalance, but rather the ability to hurt his feelings and drive him crazy. So that's what I mean, and that's what Dan Oveas meant by an imbalance of power. Someone is having power over a weaker person that doesn't have what it takes to, uh, to maintain equilibrium with that person. So the, numbers, the second thing that has to be there, the second thing is it's repeated. Repeated over time, meaning the power imbalance, uh, the behavior that drives the other person crazy happens over and over and over again. And it's intentional. Ultimately, that's what this means. It's not just one time happened by accident, but rather with uh, calculated intention, this person's trying to drive that person crazy over and over and over again. But there was a third ingredient that defined bully. And this was that the bully received pleasure from inflicting pain over and over and over again. Now, when we look at that, we say, well, that sounds like a sociopath, someone who enjoys pick picking on weak people. And they actually enjoy picking on weak people and they do it over and over again. In fact, if you study the word sociopath, that's kind of a similar definition. There's an imbalance of power. It's repeated over time. They get pleasure from inflicting pain. They're sick people. But the reality is this is only 1%. Sociopaths are only 1% of our population. But the bullying that happens is actually 50 to 70 for, uh, percent of students experience being bullied. Uh, so how could 1% do 70% damage? It's, it's just not reality. So this definition wasn't, um, it, you know, wasn't exactly accurate for the uh, American uh, kind of lawmakers. So they wanted to get really, really specific. So Susan Limber, who is now the national director of the uh, Oveas program here in America, uh, helped narrow the definition of bullying even more. And it included several specific behaviors. It included um, physical, like pushing and shoving. It included verbal, like name calling, picking on each other, calling each other fat or using degrading words. Um, it also included social exclusion. This is a, a, a term used by, um, you know, to describe this way. Hey man, me and my group are cool. We're not going to let you hang out with us. You're not cool enough. I'm going to exclude you. That's called social exclusion. That happens all the time. Another word for it is clicks, right? Everyone has clicks. Uh, the, another term that was used, or another way to specifically describe this behavior, was uh, rumors or gossip. I'm going to talk crap about you to my friend, and they're going to talk crap about you to his friend. Next thing you know, there's a big old rumor going around about you. This is a more socio-psychological, like manipulative form. This is subtle. This is overt. Or no, not overt, but it's covert. It's subtle. It's, it's going around you to drive you crazy. Now you start hearing about uh, yourself from other people, and it drives you mad crazy. So rumors is something that they threw in there. Another one was uh, jokes. They said bullying could uh, describe a joke. Think of the Yo Mama jokes. Um, Yo Mama's so fat uh, that she sat on Skittles and popped out a rainbow. <laughs> How horrible! 
or you're so ugly, when you look in the mirror, your reflection throws up, or your daddy's so dumb, he died of starvation in a grocery store. You know, these are jokes intended to hurt the feelings of another person, or pranks, like tripping in the hallway, you know, and the person gets all upset or they're humiliated that they just tripped in front of their wannabe girlfriend and now they feel like they've been bullied. That includes jokes or humor. And finally, the other one is cyberbullying. This is uh, insults that live online. And really, cyberbullying is just verbal bullying. It's words, but they live online. And then, of course, another one is choosing between friends. Uh, choosing between friends is, hey, if you're going to hang out with that girl, you can't hang out with me. I want to hang out with you, but if you hang out with her, you can't hang out with me. You're going to have to choose. It's either her or it's me. Who are you going to hang out with? That's choosing between friends. That happens all the time. You're probably thinking of a situation right now where you've seen that happen. And uh, finally, uh, another form of bullying is simply fear or intimidation. Fear. So like a gesture, like, come on, punk, like that, trying to get another kid to be afraid. Um, that fell under the list of what bullying meant. I remember being at one uh, a conference that I spoke at and this uh, precious kid raised his hand and he said, uh, Mr. Brooks, how do you, you know, stop someone from chasing you? Because there's this guy at my recess that always chases me and I, how, how, do I, how do I stop him? And I thought for a second and I said, well, stop running. Dude, just stop running. I mean, what's he going to do if you stop running? Oh, no, the kid said. I said, is he going to beat you up? The kid said, no. I said, why isn't he going to beat you up? Well, because he's going to get in trouble, the kid said. That's right. He's not going to beat you up. He's no idiot, right? He's not actually trying to hurt you or send you to the hospital. He just wants you to be afraid. And if you're afraid of him, he wins. But the moment you stop being afraid of him and the moment you stop running and say, I don't know why you like to be around me so much, but it's all good, then he's going to be puzzled. He's not going to have any fun with you and he's going to leave you the heck alone. But fear is what the bullying experts say constitutes the word bullying. Now, I don't know about you, but all of those specific terms that I used do not describe crimes. In fact, they describe every single day um, social aggression. They describe conflict. They describe a human's childhood. They describe humanity. There's rumors in the workplace. There's threats and fear, certainly, in the workplace. There's, uh, there's cyberbullying. I mean, just look at politics. One politician will write a blog blasting another politician. And the commentators that love to commentate on politics, man, they, they assassinate people's character. You know, on, online, they, they try to impeach people in office. And they are venomous. The more venomous their words online, the more hateful their words, the more viral it becomes. Shock jocks make their living on being horribly hateful. That's the world we live in, man. You look at sports teams. People hated, uh, you know, a, a sports guy, you know, a, an athlete that leaves like LeBron James. Man, his jersey is burned. People despise that guy if he moves to another team. Or if you're popular or an actor and you say something or do something in the public eye, you'll be humiliated in public. This is life, man. This is the American life. We've become, in a sense, uh, a country that thrives on anger, thrives on venomous hatred, and it's become a form of entertainment. It really has. Uh, hatred has become a form of entertainment. In fact, in, uh, in, in the media, they have a, a phrase that says, if it bleeds, it leads. Meaning, let's take the most... Uh, histrionic story, you know, the story that, that will cause the most angst in people, that will rile people up the most, and let's lead with that story. I uh, mean, that's the culture we live in. And so if we're telling kids that no one has the right to spread a rumor about you, no one has a right to call you a mean name, and no one has the right to exclude you, you must be friends with everyone and everyone must be friends with you. Well, then when they graduate out of school, they're going to be unprepared 
for the world we live in. You know, there's some neighborhoods that I drive past that have gates on them, and I can't go through into those neighborhoods. That's social exclusion. That's social exclusion. They won't let me become part of their little country club because I'm not a member. That's exclusion. Costco, Sam's Club, excludes non-members. This country excludes non-citizens or aliens, as we call them. That's a terrible term, isn't it? But that's what we do. And that's not wrong. It's, it's a way of life. Relationships are not special, but rather spatial. We only have enough room and we only have so much capacity to manage a few relationships. So I know it hurts our feelings sometimes when we're not accepted by a group. But if that group accepted everybody, there would no be there would not be any deep relationships. I mean, think about it. If you have a hundred friends, your relationships only go an inch deep. But if you have a few friends, your relationships can go a mile deep. This is instinctive behavior that all humanity understands and lives by. But we're teaching kids that it's wrong to be excluded. So unfortunately, um, we are raising, as uh, my mentor calls it, a generation of emotional marshmallows that are hypersensitive to anybody. And if they hurt my feelings, if, if a victim's feelings are hurt, they can tell the teacher, the teacher must punish it because it's bullying. This is why we have a problem. This is why principals who work so hard to get to where they are, they have been teachers, they have been vice principals or administrators, and they finally become a principal, and now they realize that they have to become a warden, they have to become a judge, they have to manage the squabbles of kids. This is terrible. It's terrible. Being in education is one of the hardest things now because we have criminalized everyday mean behavior. And all I can say to you is I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look, I don't like victims to suffer. I don't want victims to suffer. I wish victims, there were no victims. In fact, I've dedicated my life to help victims not suffer. Uh, and I wish that people were not mean. But the reality is people are mean. And the only way we can help victims truly is to help them directly solve their own social problems. We can't try to change the world around them because that, you know, bullying happens, mean behavior happens in silence and secrecy. It happens outside of the view of the adult. But the best way that we could help victims of bullying is to empower victims with resilience, that's tough skin, to not care what another person says, and with a tender heart towards their enemy, meaning to treat their enemy like a friend. Those are the two things you'll learn in this video training. Resilience training, teach a kid to be calm. And golden rule training, teach a kid to be kind. And I'm gonna show you how to explain this to a kid. So simple. I mean, I've never seen in my lifetime so many programs out there dedicated uh, to stopping bullies on campus, trying to, you would think, uh, help students work these things out. Maybe not amongst themselves, but there's so many programs now out there. Are, are they just simply not working? Because as you mentioned, there's a rise in school violence over the last few years. We, ha we have more anti-bully programs than ever before in the history of this nation. You know, I lived in Littleton, Colorado in the aftermath of that shooting, and that was the birth of what's now called the anti-bully movement. And in the last 14 years, we, we have hundreds of programs, hundreds of millions of dollars are spent every year. And uh, sadly, Canadian psychologist uh, David Smith uh, did a meta-analysis of all the anti-bully programs, the major ones, like the Oveas program. And what he found was disturbing, that most of the programs don't help at all and many times make things worse. How so? How do they make them worse? Well, the anti-bully movement has, is based on a premise that victims cannot handle their own social problems, but they need external intervention, like the government to rescue them. So the anti-bully movement focuses on legal means, anti-bully laws, policies, procedures, you know, empowering bystanders to intervene. And they try to change the world around the victim while they never help the victim directly. And hmm. so the victim feels entitled that the government's supposed to take care of their social problems and they feel a learned helplessness that there's nothing they could do. I think it, we need to turn it around and focus on helping the victim directly become more resilient and manage 
their emotional uh, frustration. Well, give me some examples. How would you, if there is a, a school uh, per, a student on campus who says, I, I'm the victim of this bully that keeps coming up to me, what would you tell that person? I mean, obviously, it depends on the severity of the bullying that's taken place, but someone who's maybe keeps getting called a certain name and they categorize that as being a bully. What would you tell that student to do? Uh, you know, you do not have to let the rejection of others wound you emotionally. Hmm. You don't have to let the hatred of others or the, uh, the words of others. You know, Grandma used to say, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words don't have to hurt me. Hmm. Anti-bully movement experts say that's a lie. And, and all wisdom throughout history says, no, that's wise. Words only have the power that I give them. So I would tell that student, listen, you don't have to let it bury you alive or wound you emotionally, and you can learn social skills to respond to your bully in a way that will disarm them, like the ancient golden rule. Hmm. Treat that person the way you want to be treated because it's very hard to continue for them to bully you while you're being calm and kind in the face of adversity, and it builds their character and virtue, and it sets them up for a great life. Because after all, this doesn't necessarily stop in, in the schoolyard. We have, as you mentioned, there have been workplace shootings. Bullying can transcend that school-aged uh, time in life into adulthood, can't it? Yeah, I mean, half of all marriages end in divorce, not because people are nice to each other, but because they bully each other. Children are born bullying their parents, you know? Uh. So there's bullying in every facet of life. And the sooner we learn these anger management techniques and we victim-proof our students, we will bully-proof them for life. You deal with this all the time. You're on school campuses a lot. You're talking to students. You're seeing all these signs of, say, anti-bullies, uh, no bullies allowed. Uh, and I've read some of your stuff. Do you feel that the term bully, in some cases, is a label that we're putting on kids, maybe miscategorizing a kid as a bully when we should be helping them in some other fashion? Yeah, I mean, we are teaching students to hate bullies. And the word bully, of course, is a judgment term. If you thesaurus it, it's right next to idiot and jerk and punk and loser. You know, and we're teaching kids to hate. I go into some schools where it says bullies aren't cool, kick them out of school. But every moral teacher throughout history has said, love your enemies. Mm. Do good to those who make fun of you or persecute you. A soft answer will turn away their wrath. Mm. We're not approaching it psychologically. We're trying to approach it legally. And when you take a, le when you take a social issue and try to solve it through legal means, it's only going to raise the hostilities, but when you take a psychological approach and say, hey, let's equip you with response techniques to turn it around, that's empowering to the victim.